And now we return to Paris. Can you guess which woman is up now? I'll give you a hint. Music, screaming atop wardrobes, and angry husbands yelling at windows while threatening duels because she stole their wives. That doesn't narrow it down too much. If you guessed Winneretta Singer, congratulations. So while this is a Paris episode, Singer was not born there. Instead, the daughter of a sewing machine magnate was born in a castle in 1865 in a suburb of New York City. A castle in a suburb of New York City. It's the business tycoons of the late 1800s. Gaia build those castles. Gaia imitate the European nobility and then marry our daughters into them. I guess. Now, we need to note that Winnie here was the 20th of 24 children by several women born to Isaac Singer. Excuse me? (laughs) That sounds very chaotic. However, Isaac focused more on the kids from his last wife, Isabella Boyer, who was also our singer's mother and originally from France. This plays into how she became an heiress later, but first, her mother demanded they all move to Europe as she couldn't bear living in rural USA. Even a castle. Even in a castle. So they moved. First to Paris in 1866. However, the Franco-Prussian War in 1870 forced them to decamp to England. In 1873, they settled in England permanently, buying land and building a new house. Her father then hosted theatrical entertainments. Winnaretta particularly enjoyed the puppet shows and pantomimes. Her mother, on the other hand, had different tastes. She added in songs and operatic arias. I'm sure you can already see how this is going to influence our protagonist. Now, we do need to note that she was far closer to her father than her mother. This comes up with problems later, because unfortunately, Isaac Singer died in 1875. Now, just question. Um, did, did she have any relationship with, like, all of her other siblings? I imagine it would be hard for her to be, like, close to her father when she's one of 24. I remember the part where we said Isaac tended to focus more on the kids from his last wife. So he just kind of ignored them all except those last ones. To an extent. Great there guy. Were, yeah, there were others that he liked, but there's this whole legal battle over wills. Because mm-hmm. you see, Isaac dies in 1875. Winnie is 11 at the time, and the estate is being besieged. And I do really mean besieged. Because of all those other kids by different women. Yeah, that's, um, even for such a large pie, that's a lot of pieces. Yeah, the will doesn't really divide it evenly, like at all. Lawsuits are abounding everywhere because of this. Also add into the fact that Isaac Singer may have been a bit of a bigamist, so there's like, who is the legal widow? Wow. For the purposes of our story, in the end, despite the chaos of this, Winnie becomes an heiress of $900,000. Over $24 million today. Whew, okay. Naturally, this doesn't make her feel better. She has, after all, lost her father, and her mother is spending more time visiting Paris. Our protagonist here is being educated by tutors at home in England, and by the time she's a teenager... She's very much an introvert and still not getting along with her mother. Do we know of any friends that she has? Any social life? And not as much in England at this time. In 1878, her mother does move them all to Paris, and then her mother remarries to a violinist who conjured up the title of a Viscount. As one does. Singer and all of her siblings disliked him. However, she does become much more independent. So she tours museums, takes up painting, though she prefers music over everything else. Her love of music actually takes up most of her time as a teenager, and she ends up befriending composers and traveling to the Bayreuth Festival to see Wagner performances. This became an annual pilgrimage for her. Wow, so she has a life. Yeah, she has a life, and she's very much looking at her mother going, 
why are you so much of a ditz right now? Mm -hmm. However, she can't entirely escape dealing with her stepfather. After exhausting his wife's income, because Winnera Singer's mother is declared the legal widow of Isaac Singer and does get an inheritance of his fortune, so this violinist turned Viscount has been just draining away at his wife's inheritance, and he now turns his eye on his stepchildren's fortunes. Now, the children are sent away. Their father's solicitor got the boys sent to England and made wards of the court at 16. This kept their fortunes intact. Sadly, that was not possible for Winaretta. By now, her mother was also disenchanted with her second husband. But what's she gonna do, really? So what's, wait, what's his plan for these children? Like, how's he gonna take their money? Winaretta right now is a minor. So at the time, her fortune is taken care of by the executor of her father's will. There was danger, though, because as she approached 21, the legal adult age at the time, her stepfather would be able more to worm his way into getting a hold of the fortune. By, like, pressuring her or something? Yes, also take into account women not really having as many legal rights. That whole sort of, you're a ward of your father until you marry and then you're the ward of your husband sort of feeling. Mm -hmm. And so the stepfather can say, oh, I'm just protecting you and your fortune by taking all of it. That sort of thing. Winaretta is very much aware of this. On her birthday, she sets a plan in motion. She left to live with friends in the south of France and moved her assets to a Rothschild-owned bank. Then she looked into buying a house in Paris. And naturally, her stepfather was furious. His anticipated income had poofed into thin air. Add to this, he had a temper. Now, no one is certain if Winnie suffered any violence or what kind it would have been from him. But she did hire a lawyer in decamp to Cannes, that place primarily known for film festivals now, and she stayed there until her house was bought. So uh, a good escape there. You would think so. However, there is now another problem. If you've heard our episode on Renée Vivian, then you know that an unchaperoned young woman in Belle Epoque, Paris, was a no-no. It was a severe blow to one's reputation, and one's friends could stop seeing you over it. Unlike several of the other women of this podcast, Winaretta did not turn her nose up at and her back on society. She had neither the desire nor the power to challenge the status quo, so she married. This was its own minefield due to conventional restrictions. She needed an intermediary for marital negotiation. Usually, this would be the mother, but Singer isn't on good terms with her. It does have to be a trusted adult female, but she also can't ask her aunt as her advice is marry rich and titled. You can already tell this is going to be a disaster. Right, and especially since like she needs to find a guy who is more trustworthy than her stepfather, because she doesn't really have like a guy to fall back on, you know. After a quick round of husband hunting, she chose the Prince Louis Villefred de Cessy Montbelliard who was also the best choice at the time, we should note. Especially considering what happens next. While he was the third son and not destined to inherit property and fortune, he suited her needs. Namely, he was titled and of sufficient class standing to suit her purposes. Now, according to French law at the time, everything the woman owns becomes the man's property. Winaretta didn't like that. Instead, she put her property in a trust with her brothers in charge of it. This was a very wise decision. Yeah, I mean, because she's her marriage pool is not anyone that she has known for any length of time. At least she knows that her brothers have her best interests at heart. This is very true because in her haste, she didn't fully think through what being married meant and didn't speak to the groom about it either. This led to the story of their wedding night, where she climbed atop the armoire with an umbrella and yelled, If you touch me, I'll kill you. Oh, so she's a lesbian. Yes. The marriage didn't last, and then her stepfather died a month after she married. So this whole entire ordeal was all for naught. Ugh. In 1889, they separated, partly due to sexual differences and partly due to things like him feeling entitled to her money a sentiment he shared with Romaine Brooks' erstwhile husband, as we've seen. Come on, dudes. Understand that you're in a lavender marriage. Rather than divorce, 
the Vatican annulled the marriage. I asked because she's been so pure. Singer herself wasted no time moving on with renovating a house and continuing the musical salon she'd started during the marriage. She even sponsored a concert at one point. This is not to say that she focused solely on music. She was still involved in the art world as well. Painting in her own studio and then funding artists like John Singer Sargent, he who scandalized people with his Madame X painting in 1884. You don't normally think of Sargent as scandalous. What did he do? Madame X was the depiction of a woman with bare shoulders. <laughs> Not that! In 1889, she was also commissioning works from him. And then through him, she got the opportunity to submit a piece to the 1892 World's Fair in Chicago. That piece was accepted. That is so cool. And also, people should look up the 1892 World's Fair in Chicago. It was a lot happened during that time. Not everything was coming up roses. Her social standing was tenuous. Would the aristocracy continue to troop through her salon and other gatherings? After all, right, she she's was a divorcee. <laughs> Sorry. After all, she was now divorced due to the civil divorce from the French government for her marriage. So, so how does a divorcee become fashionable? She went to the queen of Parisian social life, Countess Elizabeth Graffou. Now, this woman had her own salon and knew several people who have popped up in previous episodes, like Robert de Montesquieu, the man who dubbed Romaine Brooks the Thief of Souls. Graffou also had founded a musical organization and was known as a woman of exemplary cultural taste and discrimination in Paris. Suffice it to say, this woman was great to know if you were trying to get accepted by society. So why is she going to help Winneretta? We should note that both women had much in common. Promotion of modern music and refusal to bend to one's husband's wishes. Elizabeth had also dealt with a difficult husband, but moreover desired to deal with musical patronage and so forth, as opposed to what Singer was dealing with. Being a lesbian. That being said, they were not friends, and they would never be so. More that they were going to be the balancing points in the patronage of modern music. Oh, so they're like business allies in this kind of informal business of supporting artists. So Winnie goes to Elizabeth, who finds her socially acceptable. Subsequently, her social fortunes rose, but it is a second marriage that secures the position she desires. She meets Prince Edmund de Polignac through Elizabeth and de Montesquieu. The two basically set them up on the premise that both were gay, loved music, she was rich but not noble, and he was a broke aristocrat. Perfect. Perfect true love match right here. Gotta be soulmates. Mm -hmm. It was arranged for them to accidentally meet at the same concert. Aw, cute. The two became very good friends and then had a lavender marriage in December of 1893. The two then collaborated on projects beyond just her money financing his music and her acceptance into high society. Now, her salon was filled with up-and-coming musicians, artists, and other notable figures. The writer Proust attended and the composer Debussy performed for visitors. Later on, even Colette would show up. It quickly gained a reputation for avant-garde music. Today, though, we might call it classical music. So it's big names regardless, both then and now. Very true. Following the death of her sister in 1896, she took in her six-year-old niece, However, the real event of the year was the trial of Captain Dreyfus. While Singer remained politically neutral all her life, she was considered pro-Dreyfus because her husband was. Thankfully, she managed to make her salon neutral ground as well. The same could not be said for others, as we've seen. And then Edmund became frailer. He was not robust to begin with, and in his fifties when they married, but now his health was faltering more than usual. So while Singer is trying to put his music in front of large audiences, he, it turns out, is dying. But that's rough. Does he get to have any of this acclaim while he's still alive? She does manage to put on a concert in May 1901, and the newspapers lauded it. And then he died in August of that year. Wow, so he gets a couple months to enjoy his acclaim, and then how did she take it? She lost a very good friend. So she decamped to Venice for a while, and while her social position was maintained because she's a widow, she does not return to Paris until 1902. 
yeah, understandably, she had made this life with this guy, and now it's kind of disappeared. Yes, and while she does continue with her musical salon, and she also translates Walden into French... No biggie. She isn't through with mourning until 1904, because that's the year when she gets back into the swing of traveling throughout Europe for social occasions. That that was a long morning, so it sounds like, if nothing else, she did finally find the husband that worked for her. Unfortunately, then he died. It is also at this point that we start to hear about some of her affairs. Now that she doesn't have the male camouflage. I think more that these were too big to hide by burning all her papers. The first mentioned is the composer Ethel Smith, who met her in England and then stayed in Singer's English childhood home. She wrote some pieces inspired by our protagonist, however, they were far too much alike. Willful, indefatigable, and controlling, Singer decided they should only be friends. The problem was that Ethel disagreed. Ooh, drama. The result was a 40-year-long love-hate relationship. That is a long time for a love-hate relationship. <laughs> Meanwhile, there was Olga de Meyer, the possibly illegitimate daughter of King Edward VII, and also the bisexual wife of a gay baron. Now, when we say possibly illegitimate, do we mean possibly the illegitimate daughter of King Edward VII, or the daughter of King Edward VII who was possibly illegitimate? The first one. Okay, so we don't know if she is the daughter of King Edward or not. No, there are many rumors that Edward is her father and that therefore... She is illegitimate. Huh. Mysterious. Does she know? Who knows? We're, we're just, we're living in the high society where anything goes. It's a time. It's Come a and time. join us. While discreet, the affair was Singer's most public to date. Now, what does this mean, public? How do people connect them? Rumors abound through social circles. Also, this is probably not helped by Ethel Smith retaliating with gossip. Yeah, that would do it. And then Romaine Brooks popped up. Oh, hey. Romaine. Our Thief of Souls is not quite penniless by then, and she liked Singer's intelligence and artistic sophistication. At some point, Brooks painted Singer's portrait. It's much softer than the artist is known for. Probably because she didn't want to hurt Singer's feelings either because of the affair, the useful social connection, or both. That's cute, though. She she paints her all nice. Of course you would focus on that part. Well, you know. The affair eventually broke down due to A. Singer not wanting to play mothering lover to a melancholy painter, and B. Romaine not at all comprehending why Singer would ever conform to society. Yeah, I can see where there would be that tension, where Singer has found a lot of power in conforming to society, at least to some degree, that by staying largely mainstream, she has access to her money, she has access to social capital, she has things to fall back on when things don't go well for her. Whereas Romaine, by being outside of society more, doesn't have as much to fall back on and so needs more help. They're both doing things that are good for themselves, but I can see where they would find that like deep incompatibility of just seeing things so differently. And then followed a feud with Baron de Meyer over him not repaying a loan he took from Singer. A singer kept after him over it, and that ended the affair with Olga. Oof, yeah, that is the price for kind of advocating for yourself. And then the Russians arrived. <laughs> what does that mean? Diaghilev arrived in Paris. Now, while the two did meet, she did not launch his career. However, she did invite him and several others to her salon, where they gathered monetary pledges that helped launch the Ballet Russe. Oh, wow. Because one of the benefits of her being more mainstream is that she gets to be part of a lot of history making. She does indeed. Now, the outbreak of World War I caught Singer in England. She did not immediately leave for Paris. Neither did she decide to stay in England. In the first weeks, she arranged with her brother, named Paris, for a 50-vehicle ambulance corps to form in the French capital. She then crossed the channel in October, despite her intense fear of loud noises like thunderstorms, translating 
far too easily to warplanes and bombs falling. Soon, her nephews were dying, an army captain and a fighter pilot. And now, while Winnie did not become an ambulance driver or nurse herself, she was 50 years old after all, she continued to place her fortune in various causes coffers. In 1915, she helped the scientist Marie Curie outfit ambulances with x-rays to form a mobile field unit. She then bought a building to house the blind in the Parisian suburbs and refused to dress in finery for the course of the war. The rest of the war was then spent giving charity concerts with various artists. Wow, so she really did her part. For an old woman with money, yes. However, there is now drama over English taxes. It turns out the British police put out a warrant for her arrest for tax fraud over her having a house and an unexpected long stay at the start of the war. Basically, they thought she lived in London from 1908 to 1916. There was no reporting of the outcome for her, but as only a lawyer was charged a fine, it is likely she was exonerated of all charges. Yeah, one would expect, uh, <laughs> given her wealth and position. Also, the fact that I'm certain there are tons of documents stating that no, she lived in Paris. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, that would be it. Imagine, though, she spent so much of her life being, you know, as mainstream as possible, and then <laughs> getting arrested by the British for tax fraud she didn't commit. Life has curveballs. Yeah. So the time period of World War I proved quite a trial for Singer, we can say. This is not to say that the 20s didn't have their own drama. Oh? Her involvement with the Ballet Russe continued, and then she met Violet Trefusis, the English writer coming off of a tumultuous relationship with Vita Sackville-West that included husbands commandeering planes to cross the channel chasing after them. Ah, so a chill relationship with chill people where there will be no drama at all. They met through music, which led to tea and an affair. And that started entirely because Violet asked, Will you be in Paris for some time, princess? For the next 30 years, I should think. Now, while Violet liked to portray herself as a hapless victim of circumstance or fate, it seems rather likely that she was trying to at least get on Singer's good side, quite possibly because she admired Singer's strength, and Singer in return actually nicknamed her Mouse. Aw, that's cute. As we will see, this is not the most docile of mice. Mm -hmm. Now, despite the fact that there were no irate husbands here yelling at the house exterior demanding a duel because their wife has left them for Singer, that doesn't mean we don't have whispers of scandal. Rumors of Violet finally being brought to heel by a riding crop, followed by the incident of a diplomat's wife delivering furs to the princess, where it is said she went round to the Polignac's house at 11 in the morning. She was asked by the servant at the door whether she was the lady who was expected. She said she was, and was immediately shown into a large room where she was greeted by the old princess in a dressing gown and top boots. On a sofa in another part of the room, she saw Violet Trefusis and another woman, both stark naked and locked in a peculiar embrace. She ran from the room in terror. <laughs> a peculiar embrace, eh? On the not scandalous front, she did help Violet buy and renovate a tower in France. Now, do we know if there, if it was like a BDSM thing? There are rumors about it. But we don't have any, like, confirmed stuff. I guess everyone burned everything. Yes, Singer's papers were burned after her death on her orders. Really too bad, because I would love to know, like, what that was. I mean, I don't want to invade people's privacy, but I would love to know, like, what historical BDSM was like. May I recommend for you Weimar Berlin? Well, I guess we'll just have to go there and see, won't we? <laughs> Meanwhile, Singer was busy making the Singer Polignac Foundation. It would finally get off the ground in 1928. And in fact, its first major donation would be scientific equipment to be used for biological research sponsored by the Collège de France. Oh, fancy. So it's not just the arts, it's the sciences. Well, I'm kind of continuing um, what she was doing with Madame Curie in the war, finding ways to help people in a variety of ways. 
Speaking of her fortune, the 1929 crash apparently didn't put a dent in it. Wow, lucky. This allowed her to provide funds to the Salvation Army and to the writer Colette, who tried to open her own cosmetics line to bring in more money. Did it work? Not really. Oh, because I would let, like, if there were a company today that were, like, the, you know, descendant of Colette Cosmetics, that'd be so cool. Do you want us to make a makeup company? I mean, I wouldn't say no. And of course, she still promoted up-and-coming composers with her salon, though some, including Lily de Gramont, saw it as a relic of the past. Her philanthropy would make her a chevalier of the Legion of Honor during this time. Unfortunately, going into the 30s, we don't get her opinions on music becoming a vehicle for Nazi ideology. This is possibly in part due to her ordering that her papers be burned at her death, a wish that was reluctantly carried out. So we don't, do we know of any musicians that she was promoting at the time that maybe were anti-fascist or? We know a little bit because she was inundated with letters from Jewish musicians. And while we don't get a clear picture of what she does in response, we do have concrete evidence of her taking one German-Jewish musician under her wing at this time. Gotcha. So, she did have an agenda, to some degree. Everyone has an agenda, to some degree. Fair enough. And and that she, she has cultivated this image of neutrality, um, historically, you know, with the Dreyfus Affair. Part of her wants to be supporting Jewish people as a Jewish person herself. Although, do we, do we know... To what degree she identifies with Judaism? Probably not very much. Now, we also know that around this time, there is a rupture with Violet over the younger woman's refusal to be discreet about her affairs. Mm, it's it's the same thing as was happening with Romaine, where there is that tension between being mainstream and being on the fringe. Yes, well, as we will see with Violet, it was not for nothing that she would write that across her life would be written one word, waste. Waste of talent, waste of potential, waste of everything. Oof. Now back to Singer. She does start another affair, this time with Alville Chaplin, who would later hook up with Vita Sackville West. Yeah, because historical lesbians are just like modern lesbians. Everyone's with each other's exes. And you'll even find the occasional story of U-Hauling, before U-Hauls are even invented. <laughs> Singer's health was also taking a hit. The flu put her in bed completely. Remember, by now she's 73, and we're going into World War II. With this in mind, our protagonist flees across the channel to England, and Alveol stays with her. Unfortunately, she is now in London for the Blitz. Which... We know that she's going to love, given her history of loving loud noises. Oh, definitely, definitely. That whole fear of thunderstorms and translating that to World War I bombings, that just returns in full force like a tsunami. Love it. Sounds like fun. Yeah, we're having a rave, though drugs are not helping with anything, and then Singer dies of heart failure on November 25th, 1943. Yeah, understandably, I imagine it was a stressful situation. Her funeral was not conventional. It included performances of Bach, Mozart, and others' works at the church that December. She was then buried in England in a family crypt that included her husband Edmund, and it faces across the channel to France. Aww. After the occupation in France lifted in 1944, there were commemorative articles and gatherings by friends. Her fortune and art were dispersed to a variety of institutions. The Foundation Singer Polignac actually exists to this day. It gives monthly concerts in the Avenue Henri Martin Music Room. It also funds scholarly research and holds numerous conferences on historical, literary, and scientific subjects. Oh, that's good that she, she has that legacy even today. As for her private papers, well, we've already mentioned several times that they were burned. Her niece reluctantly threw them in piecemeal, as per Winnaretta's wishes. As we can see that has not stopped speculation about and knowledge of her love life, though it was supposed to. Yeah. Well, we can thank ourselves and our culture that it has moved to a better place in understanding LGBT people. So that she is not 
nearly as stigmatized as she would have been at the time. But also we can uh, celebrate her as an icon of celebrities having a private life and the public not getting to know about it. Thank you for listening. Subscribe. Follow us on Twitter. Love us. And remember, always ensure that your butler knows who exactly is invited to the orgy.